Welcome everyone. It's great to have so many people joining us from, I can see from all around the world, that's fantastic. Um, this is the second joint webinar between the IFLA um, Health and Bioscience Library section and the Evidence for Global and Disaster Health Special Interest Group. And there's more information, if you want to find more information about us, um, you'll, we'll have links to that. So if we want to go on to the next slide. So just to make sure you're all in the right place, this is Librarian Supporting Humanitarian in Information Efforts. And so um, we'll be looking at uh, how librarians are adapting their roles. And of course, this is particularly relevant at the time of coronavirus, where it's so important to have the right evidence and data inf and information to support our decision making. So if we go on to the next slide, we, this uh, um, event is being recorded um, and we aim to be GDPR compliant. So can you see at the bottom of the screen, there are links to the policies for both IFLA and Zoom. And if you have any questions about the privacy, there's also the email contact for IFLA. Um, I said at the beginning, the microphones are turned off, um, but we'll have the opportunity to ask questions as we go through. There's a question and answer section at the bottom of the screen. We won't be answering those until the end of both presentations, um, but you're also welcome to use chat. So great everyone's found that and has got used to it because if you want to share your own experience, if you want to comment on what's being said, please do that. And as I say, you can ask questions at any time. It's just that we'll look at them at the end. Um, the presentation will be recorded and it will be added to our um, both sets of pages. So you can see the links to um, find more information about both the section and the SIG on this slide. Um, we will also record chat, but that will only be so that we can highlight any key resources, for example. It's great to have you with us. We would love to also have you joining us with social media. So both um, the Twitter handle and hashtags are on the screen here. Please feel free to tweet about this event as well. Okay, so um, uh, without further ado, I will welcome our two presenters. So we have Bethany McGowan, who is based at Purdue University. She's the Assistant Professor of Information Studies and Health and a Health Science Information Specialist. And Bethany will be talking to us about um, her experience with MAPAFONS. And then if we can go to the next slide. We'll then go straight into a presentation by Jo Wood, who is um, based at Public Health England. She's a knowledge and evidence specialist there, and she will be sharing her experience working with Evidence Aid as the COVID-19 project coordinator. So without further ado, I will hand over to Bethany. Thank you, Emma. You're always so gracious in your introductions. Um, hi everyone, uh, good to have you all on with us today. Um, so I have just included a couple of links here if you want to link out to some of the resources that we'll talk about today. Um, this first one is a link out to the OpenStreetMap team task manager. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in some of the mapathons or mapping events that I talk about, that's sort of a good starting point for there. And then I've also included uh, a link to the Evidence Aid COVID-19 Evidence Collection if you are interested in looking at that. Um, so I just wanted to start my portion of the presentation with a little bit of background information about my research to give you some scope for where I'm coming from and what I'm talking about. Um, so the first link is if you want to know more about my research around hackathons and datathons. Um, and so that I sort of discovered mapathons um, through my work with hackathons and datathons. And they really came about um, because I wanted to uh, have something, a uh, sort of data competition that was a little bit more inclusive to uh, women, to minorities, to first uh, generation college students, people who uh, it was sort of challenging to get to participate in maybe like a traditional hackathon data challenge. 
Uh, and so that's how I discovered mapathons. But um, I do have a, an article in the IFLA journal, um, October issue, I believe, that talks about um, encouraging diversity uh, in sort of data competitions. So that's a good read. And then the second article is uh, more specific to what I'll talk about today. And that's specifically looking at students who participate in mapathons and looking at their motivation. Um, because these mapathons are extracurricular, they are things that students opt to do with their free time. I was really interested in trying to better understand why they wanted to spend their time um, conducting uh, mapathons and mapping. And sort of a, a sneak peek into the findings is they were really motiva uh, motivated by, by altruistic factors like they were doing it for the global good or they were doing it to help. But they're also motivated by personal factors. They were looking for ways to uh, boost their data science skills and hoping to uh, sort of add the expertise to their resumes. So that's just something good to know if you are planning to uh, host some of these mapathons. Uh, that article is specifically looking at um, strategies that librarians can use to better market them. So I've started talking about mapathons, but what am I talking about? What are mapathons? So mapathons are sort of coordinated mapping events where participants used GIS data, so they have um, geospatial uh, data and satellite images to create open source maps. And these maps are generally used for humanitarian support purposes. For example, they have been used to improve the mapping of undermapped communities and they help support disaster relief efforts, economic assessments and energy management analysis. Um, mapping activities offer librarians sort of a learner centered means to teach data literacy and visual literacy. And when I say learner centered, I mean that um, they offer you a way to teach that isn't just you standing and lecturing. They really allow students to ask questions to discuss and to practice hands-on learning. So they're very engaged and have ownership of their learning. My experiences with, the, uh, with mapping and with humanitarian mapping have almost been exclusively with the OpenStreetMap team. Um, so that's a nonprofit organization, uh, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, also um, called HOT provides res uh, free resources and training to prospective mappers and to mapathon hosts. So you can map individually just as a person uh, on your own, uh, or you can map uh, as, a, as a party or as a team. And if you do that, that's called mapathons. So it teaches you to host mapathons and it also teaches you to map individually. Um, I recommend doing a little bit of individual mapping on your own before you uh, maybe uh, try hosting the mapathons because they uh, it helps to sort of know what you're doing before you start to be a host. But the uh, hot uh, resources are very good. And if you're just beginning, um, they really do sort of guide you by the hand in, in executing um, mapathons. So I've included the link there if you want to uh, look to see what sort of trainings are available. Librarians seeking hands-on mapping experience can visit the HOT website to practice mapping and to learn to host mapathons. That uh, site also uh, allows hosts to advertise public events. So if your uh, event is going to be open to the public, if you're not just restricting it to the students at your university, um, you can advertise online on the mapathon site. Uh, and they have a whole community of mappers, people who are really passionate about this. Um, and, and are happy to uh, help you uh, move your mapathon forward if you uh, invite them to your event. So definitely consider uh, posting your events publicly if you opt to host mapathons. Um, you can also view information about upcoming mapathons. So if you want to see who's doing what in your community, if there are already people established um, in hosting, you can get involved with them. Or if they're not, you can start your own, your own events. 
Uh, examples of how libraries specifically have hosted mapathons to support disaster relief have been highlighted in the news for some time now. I've included uh, some links out to MIT and Columbia. Those are from like New York Times articles um, that are highlighting the roles that libraries uh, took to respond to uh, various disaster uh, relief um, initiatives via these methodons. So this is something that libraries and librarians have been involved in for a little while now. I'm really interested again in mapping from an instructional perspective. Um, in my role at Purdue, I heavily, I do a lot of teaching. Um, I do a lot of information literacy teaching and I do a lot of data literacy teaching. So while I recognize and appreciate and support the initiative to uh, create free maps, it's also very important to me as a librarian and as an instructor that my students are learning from uh, the activities, the mapping activities that they participate in. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about mapping as an instructional tool. So mapping really teaches students to validate data sources. Uh, it teaches them to observe and question data gathering methods um, because they, while mapping is easy in terms of just outlining buildings and outlining roads on maps, they also have to think about like if the existing data is accurate. Um, and it also teaches them to question data quality. Um, these are practices that improve both data literacy and evidence-based decision-making. Maps can be used as evidence to uh, support and formulate research questions. So after students have these data literacy skills down, they can also use the maps that they themselves have created to uh, help answer research questions. For example, what might a map tell you about a community's health needs? Uh, what challenges might a community face if the closest freshwater source is 100 miles away or if the community doesn't have a major road infrastructure and is not connected. So this is an example of what an open street map map looks like. Uh, this is a small section of Purdue University. We have lots of mappers at Purdue, so this is a very well mapped area, but I just uh, have this here to sort of show you what a, a, a well mapped area looks like. Um, so you can see that the buildings here are outlined, but we also have all of our uh, streets here um, outlined uh, and mapped. Our pedestrian paths are mapped. Uh, and if you look over sort of on the right hand of the screen, you can see that map data box. And uh, one of the things that I love about this open street map map in terms of teaching and helping people uh, think about research questions is that it has so much map data. So the map features function that I have dropped down um, will let you uh, decide if you want to look at like points. So points are uh, like buildings, so maybe like the Starbucks cafe, uh, if there is a police station or a hospital, those will be highlighted, so points of interest. Um, you can also just look at traffic roads to see how um, roads are connected, but also how they work. So if they're roundabouts or if they're one-way streets, you can you have that data um, by looking at the traffic roads. You can distinguish by service roads, um, you can see how pedestrian friendly or how uh, bike friendly an area is by looking at paths and looking at um, bicycle paths and pedestrian paths. So there are just a lot of questions here that really address sort of um, place-based research questions um, that help health sciences students particularly figure out um, what issues might be faced by a community. Again, in line with my instruction element, I'm very intentional about using um, already established standards to sort of support and guide my instruction. So one of my favorite resources um, now is the ACRL. So if you're not in the US, the ACRL is uh, the Association of College and Research Libraries. Uh, it's sort of organized underneath the American Library Association, uh, but specific to university and college libraries. 
Uh, they have these visual literacy standards that really help guide the design of uh, the learning objectives that I come up with for my mapathons, um, how I come up with my activities, and then how I assess learning. Um, and these really help me teach students to critically view and use map data and aerial photos to produce maps. So most of my learning objectives center on one or more of the competencies from the ACRA visual literacy standards, but I tend to focus on um, making sure that students understand the ethical, legal, social, and economic issues surrounding the creation and use of maps. So that's what I'm, I get excited about. And then there's this other book that I just want to highlight because it's very practical if you think you want to really dive into Mapathons as an instructional tool. Um, and that's Visual Literacy for Libraries, a Practical Standards-Based Guide. Uh, it's also based on those ACRL Visual Literacy Standards that I showed just a minute ago. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a book that has like worksheets and activities. And if you don't want to think of completely new activities and worksheets, then this is a great resource for um, sort of pre-made things that you can go over with students. Um, and so they, again, focus on discussions around the ethical and social aspects of map creation and trustworthiness. So the one thing I will say is this resource, it doesn't focus exclusively on maps, but it does have a section that talks about map creation and thinking about trustworthiness in, in map data. So what does this look like in practice? So at Purdue, I've hosted uh, one to three extracurricular mapathons per semester. I started this in fall 2017. Um, I mostly teach undergraduate students. I find that they are uh, probably the most ideal audience for this sort of activity, this sort of event. Um, and my, uh, the best sort of bang for my buck in teaching has really been on focusing on learning communities. So in the US, learning communities are sort of um, uh, communities where students live and learn together. So they live, tend to live in the same dorm or around the same uh, dorms. And they also take a lot of the same classes to meet a certain requirement to be in their learning community. So we have several health sciences based learning communities and several data sciences based communities. Uh, and that uh, has proved sort of the, the best audience for reaching out and um, having students actually attend uh, our events. Uh, a part of learning communities is that students are expected to participate in extracurricular events. So I found that Mapathons really offers synergistic opportunities for librarians and learning community stakeholders to really collaborate and work well together. Um, so depending on how connected I am in the learning community, I can host from one to three Mapathons uh, every semester. So I sort of mentioned earlier about what we, we look at. Uh, I did a study that looked at student motivation to sort of figure out why students participate in mapathons. And one of the things that I found is that they are very invested in trying to build their data skills. So one of the things that I love about OpenStreetMap is that it tracks how much mapping you do. So it really gives students a very tangible number when they are you know, adding things to their resume. They can share this that like, oh, I'm very involved in mapping. I've mapped for over, you know, X amount of, of hours. Um, this is like an account that I created this morning. So I only did, you know, 33 minutes of mapping, but I managed to map 164 buildings in that time. But I really like that they track this and, and if the students want to reference back to it, they can. You also get your mapping status. So right now I'm a beginner mapper because I, I just created this account and I just started, but you can move up to being an intermediate mapper and then an advanced mapper. And the higher up you go, the, the more you're allowed to do. So as a beginner mapper, my opportunities are gonna be a little bit limited in what OpenStreetMap is going to let me edit. But as I get to be better, I'll, I'll uh, have more opportunities. So that's how that works. 
So in wake of COVID-19, I'm really pushing mapathons because they can be hosted completely virtually. You can do them uh, all online. You don't have to meet your students in person. And it's a way for students to still be connected to you as an instructor and to each other, um, even though they might not be on campus or they might not be in a classroom together. Uh, once mappers create an OpenStreetMap account, they can map on their own time or mapped during plan event, uh, planned events. Also, in wake of, of, of COVID-19, the global uh, humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uh, had a, has a statement about fighting COVID-19, and I'll talk about that just a little bit. Um, but they're really focused on providing three uh, critical services to uh, help reduce disparities related to COVID-19. The first one is helping government agencies and responders with basic data needs. Um, and they're focusing on the UN humanitarian data, data exchange to uh, help do this amongst other things. They're also helping to identify populations living in places most at risk, pro, uh, prioritizing uh, their existing queue of mapping projects to get volunteers immediately mapping areas with high proportions of COVID-19 cases or, uh, or greater vulnerability. And then finally, they are creating new mapping projects for high risk places. So what does this actually look like? So this is again, me logged into the OpenStreetMap team task manager. And I can see that uh, when you're looking at projects that you might want to work at uh, on projects that are open, you have a couple of options. Um, they always rank their projects by urgency. So the most urgent projects are going to be at the top. And in this specific example, again, I pulled these images this morning. So right now, the uh, COVID-19 response for Kenya, Mali, and Jamaica are sort of the top three priority issues. And then the Beirut port explosion is also sort of a high urgent priority. Um, and so those are the projects that if you're going to do a mapathon, it would really help uh, uh, the OpenStreetMap team if you focused on those because they are high need. So you can sort of see if we look at, for example, the first, the, the Kenya um, COVID-19 rapid response, that the area that's highlighted in red shows you how much progress is being made in completing um, the mapping of that area. So it's a little less than halfway done, but if we look at that dark gray area, that is mapping in progress. So there are a lot of people actually mapping this project currently, or at least there were this morning. Uh, and then that light gray area are the mapping that still needs to be done. So if I was gonna host a mapathon, I probably wouldn't focus on um, the second, the Mali region, because I can see that that's almost done. All the mapping for that area is basically almost complete. The other thing that you wanna pay attention to when you're choosing your projects from the screen is the mapping, um, the intermediate mapper or the beginning map mapper, what the status is at the bottom of that square. Again, if you're a beginner mapper, you really want to stick with the projects intended for beginner mappers. The intermediate mapping projects do get to be very advanced and very difficult. So if you're leading a new group or if you're new yourself to mapping, then the beginning mapping area is what you want to stick with. Okay, is there anything else that I want to show? I think that's that for that page. Um, Okay, so this is, I have clicked onto that Mali region that, um, that was almost completely mapped. And once you open the uh, sort of the project, you get a lot of information about what's going on. So I can see under like types of mapping that they're mostly expecting me to be mapping buildings. Um, so some of the more popular things to map are roads, buildings, and waterways. Um, and then some of the lesser uh, popular options are type of use and that little asterisk is other. So most of the time, particularly for beginning mappers, you will see that the roads and the buildings are probably what they expect you to be mapping. Um, you get a nice little map of the area just in case you don't know where Mali is. 
sort of indicated on that map. And then if you scroll down, you get a nice little description about what the project is. So all of the COVID-19 projects now include this nice, like message about um, why um, the hot team is involved with COVID-19 and what they're expecting to um, do. And then you also get a little bit of information that's more specific to the goal of the project that you're looking at. So I know that this project is really trying to focus on uh, digitizing buildings. So that's what I'm gonna be focusing on if I uh, choose to pursue this project. Oh, they also give you a nice little warning here as well. Although open to beginner level mappers, the buildings in this project might be quite dense. So split or unlock the task and move on to something else if you're comfortable with, uh, if you're more comfortable, that you're more comfortable with. So just pay attention to the description because it really does include a lot of information that's gonna be useful for um, what you need to think about when you're mapping these areas. All right, and then this is after I have uh, said, yes, I definitely want to map this area. What can, what do I need to do? So after you commit to mapping, you get these, uh, a list of very specific instructions. Um, for beginner mappers, there's, the instructions are very robust. So if you read these, you really shouldn't get lost because they link out to YouTube and they link out to different tutorials and they really give you a lot of information about what you'll be doing um, if you uh, commit to mapping the area. In this map area here, you also get a lot of information about what's already been mapped, what's available for mapping, and what sort of is in the process of being validated because it's already been mapped. So you can kind of see that a lot of this area has been mapped, but that white sort of square still needs to be completed. And then finally, this is what uh, mapping actually looks like. So you get a assigned sort of a task. And when you're mapping, you get like this pink square. So you're not supposed to stray outside of your square at all. Um, so you so this there's I like this picture because there's one little building where my square um, runs right through the building and I wouldn't map that. So you don't map anything that falls outside of your area. Um, so you sort of um, what I would do here, because I know that this map is, is focused on buildings. Every time I see a building, I would click that area feature and just outline my building and that's kind of it that would map that area for me. You have to be very precise when you're mapping the building. So if you need to zoom in so your, your square isn't too big or too small, uh, it's really important that you map precisely. So that's sort of the biggest thing there. And then if you just get tired of mapping before you finish your task, you can say, no, you didn't complete the task and then log out and someone else will finish it or Maybe if it's still around, when you log back in on another um, occurrence, it will be there for you to complete. That is the end of my presentation. That's the mapping. And um, I am going to uh, turn things over to Joe. Um, so I think the point of the presentation was to highlight digital uh, measures that librarians are involved in and engaged in. Uh, and so while uh, mapathons are my passion, I did help out a little bit with this evidence aid collection that Joe is going to talk about. And so I'm really excited to hear her um, turn things over to her. Um, well, while we do the handover, um, I was just interested to know if any participants have done mapping themselves. Has, has anyone else had a go at this? And thank you, Bethany, for taking us through it step by step so clearly. Um, I should say, as well, just to remind people I'm, I'm asking you, but everyone is on mute, but you could use the chat box. And please take the opportunity, if you want to ask any questions, you can go down to the Q&A section at the bottom and um, put your question there, and then we'll look at questions um, at the end. And lovely to see that from um, 
Caroline here, she's saying that, yeah, you've inspired her. So I'm sure you've inspired many of us. So let's spotlight Jo now, and we will hear all about Evidence Aid. Great, thanks Emma. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, thank you, Bethany. That was a brilliant presentation, and I'm quite a, a visual person. I like seeing things and playing with things, so it looks fascinating. So I'm going to go off and have a play later, so thank you. Um, I'm Jo Wood, and I'm going to be talking about Evidence Aid's COVID-19 Evidence Collection. So a tiny bit about me to start with, uh, just to elaborate a tiny bit on um, Emma's lovely uh, introduction to me earlier. I'm currently the Knowledge and Evidence Specialist for Health Improvement at Public Health England. Uh, we've had a nice quiet week and haven't been in the news at all, so you know it's all fine. And prior to that, I uh, managed a library for social workers. I predominantly worked in the third sector and the public sector. Uh, I became a qualified librarian uh, in 2006, uh, chartered in 2008, and became a, a fellow of SILIP, the Library and Information Association in the UK in 2019, and I'm based in London. So Evidence Aid uh, was established after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, and it became an independent charity in 2015. It works with partners and contributors worldwide to provide organisations and people with the evidence they need to make well-informed decisions following disasters and other humanitarian emergencies. Uh, they have developed and maintained several evidence collections, including one for Zika, one for Ebola, and for the prevention and treatment of uh, malnutrition, and that's at the bottom of the slide there as well. And their newest collection is for COVID-19. So the Evidence Aid Coronavirus Collection, or the COVID-19 Collection, was created in March uh, 2019, uh, sorry, March 2020, in response to the global, uh, global pandemic. And the Evidence, the rationale behind this was that the evidence base is, is developing rapidly, uh, it's overwhelming, it's difficult to navigate and to keep up with because new stuff is coming out all the time. We don't know the quality of it, whether it's useful or whether it isn't. So Evidence Aid aims to make the best available evidence available to everyone and accessible and open access and free so nobody's paying to access any of this stuff. So to briefly explain the process behind this, what you find on the uh, collection is a link to the full text of the systematic review, open access, and you'll also find an accompanying uh, summary. Uh, and I'll explain the process behind that. Um, so what happens is literature searches for the systematic reviews are carried out either on COVID-19 generally or on specific related topics identified by an advisory group. Uh, the search results are uh, then screened for suitability for the collection by a separate group of people. We have, we have literature searchers, we have screeners, we have an advisory group. Anything that hasn't been summarised before uh, is um, identified as being useful for the collection, then goes to an academic who prioritises them uh, from one to three. So if we have P1, priority one, that's super important and needs to be allocated immediately to a summariser. Priority three, still useful, but kind of lower priority. And then uh, I have a volunteer that downs, downloads the PDFs and the templates for the summaries, and then I allocate the summaries. Uh, when a summary has been written, it goes through three people, three stages before it's approved for the website. Quite often what the summary writers write is quite different to what appears on the website. The germs are there, the germ of what they wrote is there, but sometimes it changes based on, on the formatting and a repeat ad, fin, ad infinitum. Um, the great thing about the summaries, they're super short. So they're generally a uh, page uh, long, page very four generally, a bit less. Uh, they're bullet point effectively. It's how they're useful, why they're relevant, why they matter. And they're written in plain English. And they're also uh, translated into several other languages uh, to make them as accessible to possible, as possible to people all over the world. And uh, as of today, as of this afternoon, there are 386 reviews, summaries, relevant to COVID-19 on the Evidence Aid website. That's my standing start of zero in mid-March 2020. Um, I just want to give you a, a, an insight into how many people are actually involved in doing this. Um, there's people from all over the world involved in this project. Um, from the advisors, the core team of which I'm now part, uh, the literature searching group, the screeners, uh, the communications and translations, the social media people, um, categorizing and tagging the resources, and summary writers and support, and website support. So just to say, I actually now coordinate the work of the library searches and, and services and searching team, and the summary writers and support team. So they're my kind of my two core bits, and I'm part of the core team as well. 
so how did I get involved? Well, I need to keep this very, very professional because I know that Anne Bryce and Wendy Marsh from Public Health England are on this call and uh, will be watching what I say about this. So this slide is really the short version of the story, but I'll elaborate on, on it very slightly for you. So it's slightly more complicated than that. Uh, Public Health England has a global health outreach function and the Knowledge and Library Services team, of which I'm part, has been involved in IFLA's work for some time, thanks to the very lovely Emma and Anne. Um, and in March, um, I, along with the majority of my colleagues in Public Health England, started working at home full time. And the start of lockdown coincided with a rush of PHE staff being moved over to support COVID work. And uh, if you wanted to go into a cell, uh, one of the uh, groups that was working particularly on COVID, um, the demands on time were quite big. I've got a family, so I couldn't commit to shift work and 12 hour days. Um, and, but my health improvement work dropped as people moved over to support the COVID efforts. Um, and I do health improvement. So at that point, I wasn't getting a huge amount of work to do. Um, I spoke to uh, Wendy Marsh, who is the head of the Knowledge and Library and Services team. And uh, I said, oh, is there anything I can do to help? I can't commit to the long hours. I can't do the really rapid stuff, but I, I, is there something I can do? And they'd got a list. They put together a list of tasks. And she said the immortal phrase, I have just the job for you. Now this is terrifying because generally it means it's something terrible that nobody else wants to do and she said well it will use your dip diplomacy skills and your management skills and I think it'd be really good for you and I was like oh goodness okay and then I had a chat with Anne Bryce and she, and she asked me if I knew what evidence aid was and I had to confess I'd never heard of evidence aid before and she explained that there was, uh, had been an approach from PHE uh, to PHE from Evidence Aid to support their coronavirus collection. They were just getting it up and running. And initially, I was asked to coordinate the work of a small cohort of literature searchers. Um, and in the first call I had with Claire and, and Margaret from the team, I was told this might take two to three hours a day, for a little bit in the morning, uh, not a huge amount to do. Uh, oh, but they had some, uh, a small cohort of volunteer searches, but they really needed some more. And I said, oh, well, I might be able to help with that. I've got some uh, connections. Um, I used to do a podcast called Librarians with Lives, which is massively neglected, a bit busy with a pandemic right now. And uh, so I, I did a little evidence aid episode on there as well. Um, I also uh, know of a couple of um, searching groups in London of librarians that do health systematic reviews and searches. So I put a call out to them. Um, I have to confess, I don't really like the idea of, of volunteers in libraries. Um, I think that people should be paid for what they do. So I was very mindful of that when I was putting a call out, particularly at the moment when everyone is going through a pretty awful time. And it was very much, please, if you want to do this, then great. If you would like to do it, but don't feel you can, I absolutely understand. And so I developed a cohort of, of searchers, which was really lovely. Um, Broadly, they work in health, um, some in the NHS, some of them have been furloughed and wanted to keep their hand in with searching. Some had been redeployed um, because they couldn't work in their physical workspaces and so they wanted to keep their hand in with searching. Uh, so I was able to uh, offer them literature searches to do. Um, I also created all of the uh, documentation and the workflows and the processes and the templates for allocating searches um, dealing and dealing with the literature searches. And that was fine. I kind of set that up quite quickly. I got my little cohort of searchers. The advisory group started giving me uh, literature searches to distribute to people to do, all lovely and fine. And then it snowballed because Evidence Aid had put a call out on Cochrane Task Exchange for people to volunteer as systematic review summary writers. Now, originally, they, they thought that maybe they had two lead researchers working on the project, that they would be able to write the summaries for the reviews that were coming in. And it became very apparent that they couldn't do that. So, so a call was put out on task exchange um, and they needed someone to coordinate their work as well. And originally the, uh, the, the lead researchers were gonna do that, but they were feeling very overwhelmed because they were trying to write summaries, check summaries, get summaries approved to go on the website. It was too much. So I kind of went, oh, well, I'll do that. I'll step in. So um, and my PhD work was still pretty quiet at this point. So I offered to take that on in addition to managing the work of the lit searchers. So um, it snowballed a bit, shall we say. Um, so here's what I actually do uh, in practice now. Now the top half of the slide is uh, what you'll find on my LinkedIn, the kind of the professional bit, but what it really involves is the three points at the bottom of the page. Um, 
when I started coordinating the work of the literature searches, it wasn't something you could do just by drawing things in email or anything like that. So I'm a very kind of project management oriented person. I like to know where things are. I like to have everything in one place. I like uh, things that are color coded and organized. And um, so I created spreadsheets with their different workflows and processes on them. Um, and that was fine for the lit search. I did a fairly simple set, uh, version for that. Um, as well, a lot more summary writers. I have nearly 40 as opposed to literature searches around about 10. Um, I took my original idea of the workflow and kept evolving it until uh, it kind of mapped what I needed it to do. So uh, now I know exactly who's working on what, when they've been allocated it, at what stage the summary is sitting in the process, uh, who it's with, as I said earlier, summaries go through three stages before they go on the website after they're written um, and when they're added to the collection on the website. Um, I also record when a summary writer and a lit search last, last did some work for us. So I'm not over allocating to, to particular people, but I'm not leaving people off and forgetting them either. Uh, recently, I've taken on a bit of additional work, which is checking the screen list of systematic reviews when they come back from the screening process after being searched for, uh, to see if there's any potential for combined summaries. One of the things that we've noticed is that there's an awful lot of overlap with particular topics uh, in COVID-19 uh, systematic reviews. And, and as the evidence base expands, there's no point three different summary writers writing three different summaries on um, links between COVID and diabetes, for example. So we're com producing combined summaries um, to avoid duplication of effort and to bring reviews on particular topics together. And um, I also identify gaps in the collections and oversaturation of resources. Uh, there are certain things we've got. There's, there's an awful lot of information on does the new thing add anything new to the evidence base? Does it fill a gap? Is it just repeating? Is it of good quality? Um, so I'm kind of helping to assess that before it then goes to be prioritised because what we don't want is, is for it to go further down the line in the process. It gets to the uh, lead academic and he say, we've got loads on this. Why have we bothered summarising this when it's gone through a summary writer and several stages? So I'm kind of helping to, to um, make the process more streamlined, I think, as well. Um, I do all of my evidence at, uh, work, aid work via my PHE email, um, and I've got a couple of subfolders. And at the last count, I dealt with, as in not kind of put into a folder, but actually replied to and dealt with and has email chains for about 3,000 emails and counting since I started working on the project at the end of March. As I said, keeping think track of everyone and, and, and all the people involved is key, and I'm one of those annoying people that keeps my emails so I can refer back to them. Um, one of the things that happened quite early on in the project, kind of end of March and through April, was there was a lot of frantic kind of running around by people. Uh, they didn't know what was going on. So I became the irritating corporate memory that knew what was happening and, and could uh, go back to email chains and that kind of thing, because things can get kind of lost when everyone's so frantic. Um, a big aspect of my role is uh, relationship management. I'm the point of contact between the volunteers, whether that's the lit searchers, the summary writers, or the support staff, and the core team, evidence aid, and the lead researchers and academics. Um, everything in the project comes back to me, so I'm, I'm dealing with an awful lot of people um, spinning a lot of plates, trying to keep a lot of people happy simultaneously. Um, th things can get emotional at times. Uh, this work is uh, meaningful to a lot of people it makes a difference to people people are passionate about it um, I have to be mindful that the feedback that the summary writers particularly get is kind and constructive and the team is great at doing that uh, I also feel questions from people I also take part in um, evidence aid core team phone calls um, and I work with a team that's based uh, I'm in London uh, someone on the south coast in England uh, someone who was in Egypt, uh, is now replaced by someone in Canada, actually two people in Canada, and someone in Northern Ireland. So um, trying to coordinate our work around the world is, is pretty tricky. Uh, initially, I was going to do this work until the end of May, uh, but it's been agreed that I will now carry on until the end of October. Uh, so I now balance my PHE work, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in a minute, with my evidence aid work. So I'm, I've been loaned to evidence aid uh, for 20 hours a week, and I do my PHE work in the other half of my working week. I work full time. Um, it varies a bit depending on week to week. So 
the, here's um, a little example of some of the literature search topics that people have worked on that I've allocated and they've fed through the system and there's now summaries on them just to give you a flavour of those. Um, we have a core COVID-19 search that runs every day that gets checked by someone else. Uh, these are the kinds of searches I've allocated to searches, so pandemic measures in schools, uh, the impact of COVID on A&E admissions, for example, that's particularly prevalent um, with the NHS in, in the UK. And what about my PHE work? Now, I said earlier that my PHE work had dried up a bit in March. And that was certainly true for the first six weeks, particularly when the UK went in, or England, sorry, went into lockdown on the 23rd of March. Um, my inbox was very quiet, PHE wise. And then just kind of quietly towards the end of May, uh, people started coming back. Um, just to say, I'd only actually been in post at PHE for five and a half months before we all got sent home to work at home during lockdown. So I just got used to my job and was building relationships and then everything changed. Um, and the list of topics here is um, uh, everything I've done a literature search on since May. Some of them I've co-worked. I've not worked on them as a solo literature searcher. But certainly for the first six weeks, I was doing evidence aid work. That was my 37 hour and a half hour week. I didn't really touch much PHE work at all. Um, there's a couple of bits here um, that I've done a lot of work on. Uh, the uh, sickle cell and thalassemia evidence briefing that I work co-working with a colleague. That's been a big bit of work and the health impact of permitted development rights is uh, has been turned into a journal article by the team I'm working with and I'm a co-author on that. So I didn't realise until I actually listed them out how much PhD work I'd managed to fit in alongside my evidence aid work uh, since the end of March. So as I said, it depends on who needs me more at any given time. Sometimes I have a lot more evidence aid work. Um, Sometimes I have more uh, PHE work. So last week, for example, I had some big searches I was doing. So that was more of a PHE week. This week, it's been a bit quieter, despite the news that's happened. So um, I've been doing more evidence aid work, but it's balancing the two and working across two different organizations. And that is quite a, a juggling act, uh, to be honest with you. So in terms of the impact and the statistics of the evidence aid uh, collection for COVID-19, as I said, there are 386 summaries on the website in total, and I'm currently monitoring 103 that are currently in progress, and I have another probably 30 that I need to allocate to my summary writers. Um, quite a lot of them are on holiday at the moment, so obviously they don't want to be having uh, summary sent to them to do when they're on holiday. Just to give you a scale of the um, languages that the uh, the summaries are available in. I, I think that's really uh, neat to see that. So it's not just English, but they are written in plain English and then translated. Um, that's done by translators without borders predominantly, although some of the um, summary writers speak a number of languages, so they get involved as well. Um, I've allocated and had completed by my volunteers 33 searches. They're quite complex. Uh, they involve very complex search strings, uh, quite a lot of work to do on specific topics related to COVID since March. And the digital engagement stats are kind of updated um, as of last week. There'll be a lot more this week. So uh, 25,000, well, 26,000 people used the evidence aid uh, COVID collection in the last week. And there have been nearly 250,000 views since mid-March. And then the top 10 countries that accessed the collections last week, you will see um, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Egypt, El Salvador, Iraq, Bolivia, Algeria, USA, and Brazil. So, so the places that are really having quite a difficult time, I think, with, with COVID um, are certainly well represented there. So these statistics demonstrate the development of the collection since it started. As I said, it started off with zero and the impact and the outreach of that collection. Um, Evidence Aid is a tiny charity, uh, it doesn't have a massive staff, they've got a tiny core team that work one or two days a week, they get volunteers in on their uh, practicums and they get interns from universities and a lead researcher who works a couple of days a week and someone else who works another eight hours a week but it's a really small team. Um, so I think what Evidence Aid achieves punch, punches massively above their weight and I just think what Evidence Aid does is amazing and uh, I feel very honoured to be part of, of what they do and if I'm helping with what they do I think that's amazing. Um, there are my contact details and those for Evidence Aid as well. Um, we're happy to, to answer questions if anyone wants to get involved in the work of Evidence Aid. Just to say as I'm speaking to mainly librarians here I'm guessing 
we don't actually have any literature searches ongoing or to allocate at the moment. Um, we had a lot to start with in kind of April, May, June time. Now, because there's so much um, evidence, we're not doing literature searches as much. Just, just to say, if you wanted to volunteer for that, there isn't really a lot for you to do at the moment. If you're interested in summary writing or volunteering in any way, that would be amazing. So do get in contact. And I'd urge you all to go and have a look at the coronavirus collection search it it is fully searchable get a flavor for what it involves and have a look at the combined summaries for example if you search for masks in the search box you'll be able to see a different summaries that have been brought together on the uh, impact and usefulness of face masks and just remember the sheer scale of the work that's gone on behind the scenes to make this possible what you see is the tip of very tip, tip of the iceberg so you're seeing a link to the pdf and you're seeing the summary but there's an awful lot of work that's gone on behind that. So huge thanks to Evidence Aid, uh, their partners and their funders, the core team and the massive co co cohort of volunteers for making the collection possible. I love, uh, you can probably tell how much I really love this work and how passionate I am about it. I think it's an amazing project. Unfortunately, I think Evidence Aid is, is like many places struggling a bit with funding now it's going to run out fairly soon if any of you know of sources of funding that would be amazing because i think this work needs to continue because i think it's fabulous and the fact it's open access is brilliant um thank you so much for listening and thank you to ifla for giving me the opportunity to speak and thank you emma um and i think i hand back over to you now um thank you um joe for well Thank you to both Joe and Bethany for two wonderful and inspiring presentations. Um, I'm not, I'm trying to get the spotlight off Joe. I'm not sure it's working. I've got Maria in here as well to keep me in track, but um, yes, can, can everyone see all of us now? Um, because now we're going to have the opportunity for questions or comments. Um, lots of thanks coming through and I'm going to hand over to Maria to, to um, focus on the questions that have come in and put them to the two presenters. Thank you Emma and thank you Joe and Bethany. Uh, we have under 10 minutes and we have received uh, a few questions, not that many questions, so you have still opportunity to answer, to get your questions answered. Please type it on the questions and answers box. Um, before that, I just wanted to answer a question that came from Am. Um, um, she was asking about the countries. So as far as we know from the comments on the chat, we have 16 countries represented. And they include, I'm just going to read them in no particular order, just in the order that they were uh, put on the chat. UK, USA, Zimbabwe, Finland, Venezuela, Argentina, India, Qatar, South Africa, Canada, Romania, Iran, Bangladesh, Botswana, Ireland, Greece, and Nigeria. So a fantastic representation, basically almost um, all different continents. And um, the questions. Bethany, the first question is for you. Um, there were quite a few comments about how interesting this was, this project. For me, it was fascinating. I mean, talks about precision, mapping is precision. That's ideal for librarians. The question is, can quarantine centers, which are away from COVID hot areas, be added for mapping? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I think um, at the beginner level, if you're a new mapper, you actually don't input data about what building you're mapping. Um, so the way that the mapping works is, um, the first round of mapping is just you marking roads and marking um, buildings and such with no names. And then the people who live in that area go back and do a sort of a second layer of mapping where they add details. And I'm guessing one of the details would be like a COVID center for, for example, or like a hospital or something. Um, so you would have to either be an advanced mapper or be um, actually actively living in the community um, and be a part of that second round of mapping to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next couple of questions are for you. Um, Yo, your first question comes from Lisa. Um, she's asking, is this basically a media monitoring service but for research papers? No, no. is my answer to that. Yeah. Uh, because as I explained, uh, 
there are literature researches that carry on uh, happen behind that they're very targeted we're only selecting the best research um, whereas if it was a media monitoring thing we just have everything which wouldn't be possible because as we know there are thousands probably now hundreds of thousands of reviews on COVID and COVID related subjects so it's not that it's very targeted and very selective and anything that goes onto the website has been through a process that involves several academics if anything is of poor quality it will get pulled out and discarded so it's the best quality best available research Thank you. She's also asking, was the decision not to include research from Sweden and Germany and other higher immunity countries because they usually publish in English? Generally, it's useful if they're in English, the uh, reviews. Uh, we do have translators and we do have people that speak a number of languages so we can, I can allocate them summaries. It depends on what's available and if we can access it. it. The open access thing is key here. So if we can't get it open access, then we don't put it on into the collection so it's not a deliberate thing um, I'm not actually part of the editorial board just to emphasize so there's a there's a board of academics that actually determine what goes into the collection so they make those decisions but it's not a deliberate admission as far as I understand it oh, okay somebody was asking where the, where do the research for literature searches come from so the, the uh, uh, literature searches come from pred predominantly the UK because um, I'm in the UK and that's my, 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 research, my, uh, my, my networks. Uh, we do have some in America as well and some in Canada too and a couple in Europe. Okay, um, there's another couple of questions for you, Jo, as well. Um, do you promote the essential benefits of media and information literacy skills during this crisis? Uh, yes, I would hope so as part of my day job at Public Health England and also at Evidence Aid as well. Uh, one of the things I do uh, with Evidence Aid is I'm sort of their, their, one of their, there's a few of us on call librarians where they, they check things and, and um, one of the things that happens is that we, we um, monitor uh, reviews and papers, particularly those that were published earlier in, in, during, in the pandemic, they've been superseded or if they've been uh, debunked or disproved, obviously they get removed from the collection and that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, it's kind of baked into my day job and also my evidence aid work as well. But there are a few people doing that as part of the evidence aid work. Okay, great. Um, the last question for you, Joe. Many papers on COVID-19 were anecdotal, poor quality research. How did you highlight this with HCW's frantic to get information and guidance of any description at the time? Yes, I mean, that's been a real problem is that people are so eager to publish their research that often it's very poor and rushed. Uh, we don't publish anything that, and we don't summarize anything that's still at preprint stage. We will only um, summarize and publish summaries on systematic reviews that have gone through peer review and as I said we have the uh, editorial board and the academics that work on this so they are our safeguards against publishing anything that isn't of good quality and the way the summaries are set out um, they will say if something isn't useful and they'll be very honest about it as well and explain why. Uh, generally there's quite a lot of discussion if something is quite controversial about whether it goes on. Sometimes things go onto the website with caveats where they're very clearly explained uh, why it's not believed to be of good quality or it's awaiting further research but I think having the peer review process it's not perfect but it does help and the editorial board evidence aid involved I think it ameliorates against that kind of concern. Okay uh, Joe, Ileana was ask, actually asking where do the questions for literary search, searches come from? She was so, asking again. Yes, yeah. so we have an advisory group uh, and that's predominantly made up of academics from uh, universities around the world and they identify areas that they would like to know more about, um, quite often based on their, their own backgrounds for example. So one of our advisors is, is, has an interest in uh, the impact of um, infections and pandemics on healthcare systems. So the burden of that for example and um, the search, I mentioned the lit search earlier that we did on uh, the impact of COVID on accident and emergency departments. So for example, do more people go to A&E? Do less people go? I know there's a lot of debate, debate in the UK about um, diagnosis of cancer at the moment and whether that's fallen as a result of COVID because people aren't going and aren't having their screenings and that kind of thing. So 
he's really useful because he knows about healthcare systems around the world and also we do and i should have said this in the presentation actually we do have because it's a humanitarian charity we do look at low middle income countries as well so it's not just uh, the western world not the developed world we do look at um, how this impacts on other countries too so um, we use those advisors and also uh, to help us determine whether things are any good if, if things are of good quality we we rely on their expertise so we can call on them as well okay brilliant um we have one last question Pub publishing papers on COVID is accepted faster i think research papers on other things take a time these days isn't there a little bit bias in research that's probably a wider question than I can answer. I think at the moment, um, I can only speak, actually I've got a good example um, I, can, I can throw in here for my PhD work. Um, I've developed a um, current awareness bulletin for a team I work with on non-communicable disease modeling uh, for a very small team I work with at PHE. And I've noticed over the last few months that um, all the things that they want in there, so I kind of go through and monitor uh, the, the, the journals and the searches that they've asked me to put together to create their bulletin that I send to them every month and it's massively weighted towards COVID at the moment in a non-communicable disease bulletin. So that's interesting that the um, COVID is, is kind of infiltrating everything. Um, I don't feel qualified enough to answer that question. I can only speak anecdotally about that. But certainly, if you look at what's being published, um, it tends to have a COVID focus. I think people want to push that because they might believe it gets published or gets noticed more. So that would be my understanding of it. But I'm not an expert on that. So I wouldn't want to uh, speak with any confidence about that. OK, thank you, Joe. And thank you, Bethany, for answering the questions. We are in time now. Yes, so um, if we can go on to the, um, have we got a final slide? Oh yes, sorry, I, I should sure. uh, There we are. <laughs> yes, so as the slide says, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if there are any other questions we're picking up through chat or anything we haven't answered, we will, as well as making the um, recording available, and we always add closed captions in, in English at the very least, and um, we will also add links to all the resources that have been featured, um, but we can um, elaborate on any, any answers and publish those on the website alongside those resources. So this slide is explaining that um, this is one in a series of um, webinars that are taking place jointly between the health and bioscience library and evidence health and bioscience library section and evidence for global and disaster health sig and you're very welcome to um, come back and join more there's more information on the screen about where all the resources and the recording will be made available um, i had asked if Anne would be able to say a few words Anne bryce is the sig convener and you are welcome to but i think we are at the top of the, well we are now past the top of the hour so i appreciate that um we have run run to time uh can i do, i'll just say a couple of things then if that's possible um just to thank everybody for joining to thank bethany and joe bethany uh, a rising star in the library world and what i love about bethany's presentation was the bringing together of academic rigor but practical real community help which I think is great. Uh, Joe, um, an evidence aid, uh, not only a really good description of how we can act rapidly and contribute but also a bit of a, a story, a personal story about what it's like to get involved so thank you for that. So I just want to thank Emma uh, particularly and Maria are also helping on setting the webinar up. Um, these are ones that we want to continue and thank everybody for joining and a great list of countries and and really we want representatives working with us in our group from every one of those countries so please if you want to find out more about the SIG and about our work please do get in touch look at our resources and I hope you'll join us for the next webinar so thank you very much <laughs>